Well, Merrill Hodge, uh, quite a career as an analyst and now an author. He's got a book, Find a Way, Three Words That Changed My Life. He played in the NFL for 10 years. We used to be teammates at ESPN. Uh, Merrill always had the ability to cut through, and you were willing to be uh, criticized up to the draft. And I always loved that about you, and you and I agreed on a lot. I think Tebow, Manziel, there was a lot. We disagree on Caleb Williams, but I'm going to get to him in a second. So, first of all, thanks for coming on the show, Merrill. It's great to see you again, and uh, I follow your career, and you're wonderful. So, let's start with some a player that we both like, and we'll work our way up. So, I saw Bo Nix twice. I think he's really undervalued. Everybody loves J.J. McCarthy and Caleb and I just look at Denver. He reminds me of Drew Brees with a little mobility. You've looked at Bo Nix. Am I overvaluing him? What do you see that you like and concerns you? Well, we're going to talk about this because there's two things as I evaluate quarterbacks that are going from college to the National Football League. And these two things have to work in unison, accuracy and processing or decision making. Like they have to be as one. You can't have one without the other. If you don't have one, one of those two will run you out of the league. Yeah. So you, you at least have to have this. You got to have evidence of that. And he does do that. He processes well. Um, he throws the ball well. Um, is there any true special, unique quality in those two areas? Um, no, but they're rock solid. You know, um, and you can tell that he functions, you know, under the system he's in. And that is another thing that you got to look at. You know, he plays in a really heavy college system. Yeah. Um, you know, now you're going to the NFL. And that that's where – that's where what I try to do – I don't look at where a guy's playing. I look at where they're going to play. Yeah. You know, the field is going to change. The pocket is going to change. And how do they function in that? So when I take him and I look at – how does he function in a pocket that's going to be like the NFL? Now, listen, there's not a lot of evidence that, but I have a machine I can, I can take and I can create all those different scenarios. So in an NFL pocket, about 70% of it is dirty, clouded, and that's about 70% of the time. And how can you function under that? And can you process things and be accurate with that concept? And he's, he's okay. He's not really elite in that category. Um, so and that's a big hurdle. And that's something that's the environment that he's going to play. in. so if you see the struggles in college, you can't say they're going to go away. You have to acknowledge those and then realize, OK, how are we going to play out of that? How is that going to work over time? Will he get better? Yes. And then height does become an advantage, an advantage or disadvantage. Yeah. You know, six one is about the body. I mean, that's about the, the tipping point. You know, you love yeah. a guy around six, three. They play that less issues once you get below that it becomes a real a real issue you yeah. know um you know you know last year um uh bryce, the young. One pick, gosh, bryce, bryce young. young i mean that 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 five nine and how he played from the pocket is going to be always a problem you're never going to work your way out of that they will always have limitations with him i don't care how hard he works i don't care how great they coach those are going to be limitations how they how cj stroud didn't go one overall is still the most mind-boggling thing that I have seen when you had those two options because the evidence was there. CJ yeah. Stroud was the only first rounder that was qualified to be a first rounder that you would give in a first round. I gave a first round grade to that would transition to the national football league. And he had all of that evidence. Yeah. He, he showed that in college. If you studied him, right, you knew that he wasn't going to have a problem. You knew that you're going to have a problem with Bryce Young is going to be, and it'll always be a problem. Yeah. I mean, I know he's a great kid, but that's a bonus. That is not a, a skill set. And uh, he's going to always be 5'9". It doesn't matter how hard he works. It doesn't how, matter what he does. He's always going to be 5'9", and it's going to create limitations, game plan. Okay, so let's talk about the two top on the board. Let's go Drake May. We'll work our way up to Caleb and spend more time. Drake May, the knock on him, I saw him play two or three times. I got different versions of him. He was erratic. He moves pretty well. Um, arm strength is whatever. What do you make of Drake May? You're not a huge fan. Why? No, I because of the two things you just mentioned there of his his processing. Now I watch him function under pressures. I, I don't think I've yet to see him execute a pressure correctly. Identify it. Oftentimes he misses it. Um, sometimes when you see his head in that position and he doesn't acknowledge it and make the throw. Like those are concerning. So when I talk about processing, there's not a lot of things that I'm like really confident about that he processes things well, especially pressures. Um, he is completely erratic. 
when it comes to yes. throwing the football. I mean, it, it's a big concern. I mean, can you button those things up? Can you get a little better? Here's what my ultimate belief is from playing in this league, coaching, um, studying this league for nearly 40 years. You just don't correct that. It actually is magnified when you get to the National Football League. That is when you become more erratic. And it's on all throws. It's short, intermediate, long. Now, he'll do enough to dazzle you. And here's where I always felt the problem is, is that you say, oh, I'm going to fix that. I'm going to make him, I'll make him smarter. I'll make him more accurate. And that's where people get fired when you do that. <laughs> and I just, I, there's, there's, there's just too much there that would, um, I wouldn't give him a first round grade. I wouldn't take him in the first round. And if I did, then I would be very concerned of, you know, how long I'm going to be around as a coach or a GM. Okay, so the player we disagree with, and one of the things I stated earlier, is that we think of USC as this great brand, Texas, USC, Georgia. They have had in the two years he led the nation in offense, one elite player on the entire offense, Jordan Addison, a small receiver who's pretty darn good, tight end, suboptimal, running backs, O-line, really average. Now, Lincoln Riley's obviously a good play caller and designer, but he basically scored about 40 a weekend in the best Pac-12 I've seen in 20 years with one really elite NFL player. So that's my takeaway is he did more lifting than people subscribe to. But you do point out a couple of things with him that two weeks ago I went on the air and said, okay, yeah, that's a good point. Merrill's pretty good at this. <laughs> that he doesn't take the easy stuff enough, which Mahomes' first year or two similarly leaned into great now he's gotten rid of that. Now Mahomes is, he'll give you everything. So let's go into Caleb. What was one of the first things you saw and you went, pump the brakes? Okay, well, you, the word special is different for everybody. Okay, so the reason I say he's not special is he's, he's not special in where you must be special. If you have to show evidence, you got a chance to transition to the National Football League. So I'll give you that. There's two guys in the last five to six years that have had that, Joe Burrow and C.J. Stroud. They just demonstrated that in college. And what it, and what am I talking about? How they played from the pocket. Their processing, their accuracy, their anticipation. And I'll go back to the processing. You just mentioned it. Rather, it's a clouded pocket. Rather, it's a clean pocket. He does a lot of that. You know, the slant's there. He's, he doesn't throw the slant um, because he's done the one thing that has made him exciting. And I think people lean to saying he's special. He's extremely elusive. And let me point out one thing that he does have out of all these other quarterbacks that I do love, and it is rare. His accuracy is elite. And I'm going to tell you this, that is that right there puts him above everybody else and gives him the edge. Now let's go to the, the hurdle, why the special thing. He doesn't function from the pocket like he's going to have to in the National Football League. Now he's a guy who is 6'1". When you look at a dirty pocket, you look at a clean pocket, and you look at the different plays that he gives up where he should give, be throwing the football, but he goes and makes a play by running around. Okay, that's just not going to, you're not going to survive in the National Football League doing that. That is his biggest hurdle. Okay. Being able to manage the gift that he has was, he is extremely elusive. I'm not going to deny that. And I think that's a value, but it could be the thing that holds him back from being able to be successful in the National Football League because he'll leave plays on the field that shouldn't be left there. Yeah. And he's going to have to learn to manage that. Now, people comparing to Patrick Mahomes, the two things that we you didn't mention, Patrick Mahomes sat a year. Yes. He had some of the best coaching in the, the National Football League. Right. And in that year of growth, you're exactly right. How And then how he has developed over the years. I mean, this is what makes Tom Brady – people always say, what makes Tom Brady the greatest in the history of the game? One reason. He executes the play. If you gave, if you tell him he's got to give you six check downs, he'll give you six check, check downs in a row. And guess what? The second that you make a mistake on it, then he's going to go over the top. He's not going to hold the ball and sit there and go, I'm going to try to throw the goal. It's really not there, but I want that. Now we're second and 10. He's always moving the chains, and that's what you have to do in the National Football League. And so from a pocket presence perspective, he is not special. Now, his accuracy again, elite. He's as elusive as Barry Sanders in some scenarios, more than Patrick Mahomes. That doesn't make him better than Patrick Mahomes. Yeah. That's also a gift, but that might be the thing that hinders him more than anything is him learning to manage that yeah. and only go to it later. Now, I don't expect him to do this right off the bat. That's going to be a development thing. And I, and listen, you, those things I think you can't coach. I don't think there's any doubt you can coach those, develop those, but then that relies on good coaching and the kid. The kid has to be in that. 
and then the mental toughness that he's going to have to have in this scenario, because what are the Bears? If the Bears get him, which I expect them to do, what is everybody going to say? We made up for our mistake. We got our Patrick Mahomes. We're not a playoff team. He's going to start right away. And that right there, those scenarios are completely different than what Patrick Mahomes experienced. Right. And those are arduous hurdles to overcome. Yeah. By the way, one more thing. You played Steelers, Bears, talk Pittsburgh for a second. I think Russell Wilson actually works in Pittsburgh because in Seattle and Pittsburgh, he's not the center of the culture. Both defensive coaches create the culture. I thought when he went to Denver, because of what they paid him in the draft picks, they wanted him to be front and center. And, it, you know, he's kind of, and I, and I say this as somebody that likes Russell, he can be almost overly optimistic. You know, there's like zero cynicism. And, you know, the NFL is, guys like him to be authentic and real. And sometimes Russ, to some people, comes off as a little bit, you know, a little cringy. And, but I like Pittsburgh because Tomlin sets the culture. Russell is yep. mature and committed, and a lot of those Steeler offensive players are young and sometimes a bit juvenile. I think he's the adult in the room in Pittsburgh, and I honestly think of every team in the league, it may be the best fit for him. What say you? Well, I actually think that there's still a strong belief in Kenny Pickett. I, I will tell you this in all fairness, um, and having been around that organization and, and close to it, there is – his skill set is good enough to help you win a championship. Was it eroding at towards before he got hurt? Yes. I mean, he was playing fast. He wasn't letting things develop. I mean, he was completely out of character how he came out of college and how he started to play, which actually happens to a lot of players. This thing, I believe, ruins more players, especially quarterbacks than anything. You get ruined mentally way before you get ruined physically. Best thing that probably happened to him is that he got hurt. You got to pull him out of that blender, and he got to he got he got to sit there and watch Mason Rudolph actually function how you have to function in this league to play, and how he played from the pocket. So I, I just don't think he he'll end up there. I just think there's still a belief in Kenny Pickett, and I think with the changes they've made offensively, the youth that you just described that they have, he has a great rapport with them. He has a charisma about him and a leadership too that. Um, He's probably not talked about, you know, outside of the arena of Pittsburgh that people recognize and acknowledge that he has with players, you know, and the team itself. And, you know, I think this training camp will be pivotal for him. But um, I don't think I don't see him turning their back on him. And I think if you go get Russell Wilson, um, it would create more issues than it would solve. Good stuff. His book is Find a Way, Three Words That Changed My Life. You see the hat. Merrill, it's always great to see. I may see you on a ski slope in Utah in the near future, and it's a, it's a pleasure to have you on. That's a must. Thanks, Colin. Always appreciate it, pal.